Good afternoon, everybody. So um, I will go a little bit back and restart some of the GAs such that we have evolutionary algorithms. And the idea is that adaptation is intelligence. And people put it in a rather, I don't know, not, not nice way, at least for in a social context that this is, a, this is the survival of the fittest, which is somewhat misleading. So during the evolution, many, many species come and go. On a daily basis, several species disappear. Some of it is our fault in recent times. Most of it naturally happens. Um, and we, we may understand it as the, the survival of the fittest. <clears throat> so as we, as in the last lecture, I'm sure you have heard a little bit, so it's about how do we use this, so how to use this idea for optimization. And we talked about it that some colleagues within AI may not necessarily agree that evolutionary algorithms are part of AI because they are designed to do optimization. And optimization in a strict sense may not be understood as learning. So I don't want to get into that fight because I have used evolutionary algorithm a lot. They are very useful techniques, and there is no way that we can do AI without optimization. No neural network will run without some sort of optimization. So, and something that in the mod in modern nature has taken millions of years to create really highly sophisticated species cannot be stupid. So it's, it's, it's the concept of learning from, from um, the idea to that adaptation is intelligence. So if you adapt yourself to the circumstances, you've got to be an intelligent species. <clears throat> Sometimes you know you have to adapt, but you're just not flexible enough to run from the stone that is coming from the heavens. So you get this thing like the dinosaurs. Maybe they wanted to adapt, but they were not fast enough to adapt. The cockroaches adapt really fast. And Mice too, <clears throat> and us. So let's say given is a strange function. Let's say I have a function f of x. And I just come up with, with, with something, something really uh, arbitrary. Let's say x1 squared plus log of x2 plus sine of x over 1 minus x. Sorry, this is x3 and this is x4. So I have a function that has four variables, x1, x2, x3, x4. And for some reason, I want to find the maximum of f of x given some constraints. If you remember when we talked about support vector machines, there were some constraints. There is always some constraints. There is no optimization. So if I say maximize this, so the, the, the algorithm will go and put all values at the maximum value that computer can understand. Say, OK, here, the maximum value. But we know, or if I say minimize them, we put them all, all on minus infinity or 0, and OK, this is minimum. So optimization makes sense when you have some constraints. So I say, OK, no, no, x1 should go between this and this. x2 should go between this and this. x1 and x2 have this relationship. OK, there are some constraints, which clearly come from, from, um, from application. So now you want to 
you want to you, you want to solve equations like this quite arbitrary I just I don't know it, it doesn't make sense even to try to maximize or minimize this so I just grabbed an arbitrary function and okay this idea now this is a really this is a far-fetched ac action that we try to solve something like this with the idea of evolution so we know and I'm sure you saw something like this, that you have a population. So you're talking about a species. And this is already a, a huge simplification, because no species can be isolated. You are always affected by other species, by, by nature, by, by many things. But assuming that you can isolate a species, the gene pool of a species. When we say population, we mean the gene pool of a species. So then the gene pool of that species is a collection of many, many chromosomes that over time has created the characteristics and attributes of that species. So these are chromosomes. This is a quiet low level understanding of a population so evolution affects the genes so um, a population for me is the collection of see when you send your uh, 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 if you want to find out your ancestry uh, I have done it it's fun it's, I don't take it seriously so and then you send something and they they compare your genes with a different group of people because we are selective, they select a small part of it. Because if you compare the entire genome of us with each other, 100% match. Congratulations, you are homo sapiens. But we, we compare specific parts with specific groups and they say, okay, you match with Irish and you match with Italian. And you get a ticket, you wanna go to Italy, find your ancestors. Because Italy is the center of civilization, so okay, whatever, whatever makes you happy. So, but we are working on genes. Okay, so these chromosomes that contain the material that are affected over time, millions of years, even from the get-go, before you tell me anything, whatever this idea of evolutionary algorithm is, it cannot be fast algorithms. Why not? Because evolution is sluggish. Evolution is slow. Evolution does not happen. So wh why do I, do I don't change my skin color if I go from this continent to that continent within 50 years? Why? Well, it takes time. It takes time. It takes a long time. So what the evolution does, you do some sort of selection. So you select chromosomes. How do you select chromosomes? Well, it happens. So it, in the natural course of things, you select chromosomes. Now we are, we are trying to intentionally, uh, intentionally select chromosomes. Let's say, I don't know, one of them is chromosome like this, and the other one is chromosome like this. So I'm just doing some arbitrary pattern to be able to do something with that. So these are, these are parents. I told you, so when, 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 when life came about on the planet, then for a long time there was no diversity. We talked about that, I guess, I mentioned that. Maybe it was another class, I don't know. So we had a few species on the planet. And then with a tiny time frame, with a very, very short time frame, 35 million years, which is ex extremely small time, suddenly the number of species on the planet explodes. We get millions of forms of life called Cambrian explosion. We don't know why that happened. We have some guesses. We say uh, life, did, uh, life organisms didn't have vision before then. So vision developed, things got accelerated. More, more popular among scientists, there was no sexuality before. Sexuality developed, things got accelerated. <clears throat> so, but whatever happened is, happens with mating, M male and female. Sexuality, so that's the way that genes develop in most species. So then, of course, you have to do crossover. So when you do crossover, basically you select a random position. So now I'm talking, 
I'm trying to get inspiration from Mother Nature and trying to come up with a model. So let's say I, I grab this position. So, uh, because this will be in my computer just a vector. I can grab any index of any vector. And if that happens, so the crossover, the way, the simplest way that we can basically, the simplest way that we can uh, simulate crossover and mating is, okay, this part is coming from this individual and this part now is coming from that individual. And other way around, so now this is my offspring. So, and this was the point, the point of crossover. So, at, at, this is very simplistic, of course, as perhaps is a, if you show it to a biologist and say, what, what are you talking about? It, it's not happening like that. Well, we know. We, we are, we are coming up with an abstraction, abstraction to make things happen in computer. So, I, I, I have, go back, go back. So, I have... I have a pool of randomly generated vectors. I'm, I have to work with numbers. Um, randomly generated, right, the random weights of a network, random set of actions, values for reinforcement learning. And then I grab maybe at the moment, I have no idea how to do it. I randomly grab some pairs of chromosomes, vectors, and then randomly grab a position. And then I swap those parts, those fragments, such that my offspring, my new vectors, are a combination of the parent vectors. Okay, I just heard random, random, random. What do you want to do with so much randomness? Oh, trust me, the god of randomness is very powerful, extremely powerful. And so we can also grab one of them. So let, let's see, I, I grab this one. And I grab one position, and I apply mutation. So why that? Because we know that mutation, which appears to be a random change in genetic material, brings about a gigantic possibility for the evolution to create new things. Of course, mutation is also extremely dangerous, you mutate one gene and you get Adolf Hitler, <laughs> or you get Albert Einstein. So it's a very risky business, so we should not exaggerate mutation. Don't mutate too much. This has to happen a lot. This has to happen a lot. This is, this is the engine of evolution, mating. But this, you got to be economical with this. You cannot this very often. <clears throat> so, and then we take a look at this. Uh, so this is one of them that has been now genetically modified. And then we put it back if fit. So which means it could be that you create offsprings and you don't add it to the pool. Why? You have to answer one question. So if I have a pool of certain number of chromosomes, which for us, in the algorithmic world, are individuals. Do you want to keep increase the size of population? You can. So what do you do with memory management? So we assume this is an island that has a certain capacity. You cannot go over capacity. I only get 100 chromosomes, not more. So if they are good kids, and I want to add them, I have to get rid of two existing parents. Sounds quite brutal. I, I don't know, this type of nightmare. What social Darwinism is something really ugly, terribly ugly, that you think you can bring the concept of evolution into society. Racists love that theory. So yeah, survival of the fittest. Why, you are not the, you are not the fittest. You are just a racist bastard. So <laughs> this, has, this is very different from the course of evolution, that things happen really slowly. Evolution does not make a list to kill a certain group of people one by one. That doesn't happen that way. It happens 
naturally, slowly, and actually nobody gets hurt because the way that nature does it is very, very graceful, very graceful. So I have to answer many questions to come up with an algorithm for this. How many, what is the size of my population? I would say that depends how difficult this problem is. Uh, how, how do I select parents? Well, survival of the fittest, I, I need good parents, fit parents. But is that the guarantee? You see many good parents, their kids really not good kids. And other way around, you see good kids and you see the parents who say, oh, how, how do they get this kid? So you have to answer all those questions. And then the mating and then the mutation. How, how often do we apply the mutation? OK, so the first question in my mind is how to apply this abstract idea to the real valued optimization problem. Well, that's, that's not easy. And we have seen several cases so far. We started, we started with Frank Rosenblatt. So it's an enormous pioneering work when you come from an abstract idea to an explicit computer algorithm. That's a huge achievement. Your name definitely goes into Wikipedia, if that's important for you. John Holland was one of the first ones who was thinking about this. Say, OK, so how, how can we do this? Well, if I go back to this weird looking equation, you can grab anything. It doesn't really matter. x1 squared plus, what was it? Log of x2 plus whatever it was, sine of x3 divided by 1 minus x4. Some, some constraints. I don't care about the constraints at this stage. But there has to be constraints. Everything is limited. So there is an island. There is not enough food for everybody. I don't know. x1 and x2 are close to each other. x3 and x4 don't like each other, whatever that is. So you need to put the constraints in place. So OK. So which means we, we want to, we have to find the optimal values for these guys. So maybe, depending on their value, I encode them as binary numbers. So I just took randomly five bits. Is that, is that enough? I have no idea. I don't know what I'm doing. This is research. One, two, three, four, five. 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, and then I have 1 here, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and I have 1 here, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1. So this is this guy, this is this guy. So if I convert my numbers, the parameters that need to be optimized, in, in binary format. Why binary? I, I don't know. Binary is easy. At the moment, I just want to get it up and running after, after it starts to work. And I will think about other type of encodings. Because you have to encode the information, make it accessible to, make it accessible to uh, the algorithm. So OK, if I do this, then my chromosome My chromosome will have one, two, three, four parts, four fragments, one, two, three, four. And each one of them has uh, 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 five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Two, three, four, five. So I want to write it here. One, one, zero, one, zero. Then the next one is one, zero, zero, one, one. The next one is x3, let's say, 1, 1, 1. You have to keep it consistent. The last one is 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. Voila, I got a chromosome. So now I generate many of these binary chromosomes, binary vectors. Nobody can prevent me from creating my own terminology. 
one of the one of the one of the really char good characteristics of a scientist is they don't give it down. They create their own terminology. Because if you're creating something new, you have you cannot you cannot talk with the existing words. You have to create your own words. So I call this vector my chromosome. Okay. Whatever makes you happy. Show me, show me that it works, and I'm right with you. So then I can generate, this is 4 times 5, 20 bits. 20 bits. If, if I give it to somebody from information technology, he or she will immediately ask, how much information can you encode with 20 bits? I'm not there yet. I'm just trying to just establish the framework. Now, I can generate as many as I want from this type of vector and create my population. So now, any binary vector that I grab, I know the first five bits x x1, the second five bits are x2, and so on and so on. So I, I'm changing everything at the same time. And I'm looking, of course, for the solution. I'm looking for the chromosome that gives me the best value for x1, x2, x3, and x4. OK. Good luck with that, because at the moment, I don't see any deterministic algorithm. How do you want to do this? I don't hear gradient descent, or I don't know. How do you want to do this? Well, we get there. We get there. So OK. How would a simple genetic algorithm work? It was, it, there was an explosion before deep learning came along and killed everybody else. There was an explosion of new ideas after we saw that evolutionary algorithms were so successful. And then people went out and looked at other part of nature, looked at ants. OK, let's come up with an ant algorithm. Bees, oh my god, bees, how do they move? How do they make honey? And so on and so on. So a lot of naturally nature-inspired techniques were born. Many of them very powerful, and colony optimization is one of them. Hopefully, we have time to talk about it. If not, I will, I will upload some, some material. So a simple genetic algorithm, short GA. So GA, when we talk about GA, we mean canonical GA, the, the, the initial, the simple, the conventional. There are many, many advanced versions that we don't have to talk, uh, we, do, we don't have time to talk about it. So first of all, you initialize your population. Of course, I don't have anything else. If I don't have a population of chromosomes, I cannot do anything. So uh, how, how many? Just grab a number, whatever. 50, 100, 500. Generate randomly 500 vectors that are randomly set to 0 or 1. OK. You see, you got to be a little bit insane. Because if you're playing by the rules, nothing's going to change. Playing by the rules, you will be still multiplying matrices, which is, which is, the, which is the nice thing to do. TensorFlow does that. So. Then we go, we go ahead and we say, OK, now calculate the fitness of your population. Oh, OK. Now I'm starting to freak out because I have no idea what you're talking about. What is fitness? What, what was the driving force for neural networks? Error. What was the driving force for reinforcement learning? Reward and punishment. What is the driving force for evolutionary algorithm? Fitness. So anything that I develop, it has to be fit. Anything that evolves has to become fitter. Oh, but what does that mean? Well, depends on your application. This is, one of, this, is a, this is a key design factor for evolutionary algorithm. You have to figure out what is what function describes the goodness, the quality of the final solution? What is it? Then we have to go inside the loop. 
of course, there is always a loop, while stopping criterion not satisfied, I have no idea how long I have to do this. Because if this is inspired by evolution, while well, evolution is ongoing forever, I cannot go forever. So I have to do it within a, a specific amount of time. We'll have to think about that. <clears throat> OK, then we go inside the loop, and we do what I did. Select parents. How? OK, I, I don't know. Select good parents. Select fit parents. So you already set your fitness function. It could be that you somehow you feed in those binary numbers, binary vectors, and the fitness function just gives you a number that says the quality is that much, the fitness is that much. So select parents. <clears throat> then perform crossover. So when you perform crossover, you get offspring. Why do we do that? Because we need new genetic material. Mother Nature doesn't like it when things stay the same. In contrast to us, we, lo we, we love things to stay the same. We are afraid of change in contrast to our nature. Nature loves to change things. You have to change. OK, if you don't change, I will punish you. And I don't even tell you that I will punish you. And when you realize I'm punishing you, it's too late. You got to get this thing in five seconds. So, and after you have offsprings, we apply mutation properly in a, in a suitable manner. We apply mutation. Again, mutation is a very different mechanism than crossover, which is mating, to create new genetic material. If this is if each one of them is really a number that we converted to binary number, then you have low significant bits and high significant bits. So if you apply mutation on a low significant bit, you're converting 22 to 21. Who cares? If I apply it on high significant bits, you convert 2 to 255. Oh, that's a big change. So. We can play with that carefully. How can I bring diverse? You know, this is the mind of an algorithm designer. Forget about AI. Algorithm design has nothing to do with AI. In 50 years, AI is gone. Something else is come, but algorithm design is still there. Because we have to bring the idea to these stupid computers. And they become stupider every day. So they become faster and faster, but more stupid. So we have to, our job becomes more difficult to make them understand what we want from them. So apply mutation. And then, of course, calculate total fitness. Calculate the total fitness of population. How fit are you? So because what it happens is, over time, you start with a random selection of your gene pool, your chromosomes, and you select two. And you mutate, and you cross over, mutate, and if they are good, you add it to the population, and you grab the worst parent, and you say, get the hell out of here. <laughs> Go. Again, think about social Darwinism. So, OK, what, what happens? Then over time, only good parents stay. So if, you can, if good parents are green and bad parents are red, you start with a mixture of red and green, and you see that the population is turning green, 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 green. And then everybody is green, and then the intensity of green starts to go. Light green, dark green, extremely dark green. Oh my god, everybody is green. So that means now at the end, the fitness of the entire population should be very high. Then you have converged. Then you have a bunch of solutions. Bunch of solutions? With neural network, we were only after one solution. Whole different beast, evolutionary algorithm. They are really good if you are in a highly complex environment, but ideally you have more than one solution. So they can find some of them. And that's why the stochastic nature comes so handy. 
So, okay, okay, so again, if you have a good abstract mind that can take abstract ideas and turn it into a specific Python algorithm, this is enough to implement the first GAs. You don't need to. There are many, many uh, implementation available. So, but before I do that, before I invest my valuable time, instead of going on vacation, I should sit down and write code for evolutionary algorithm, you have to answer some other questions to convince me to do it because uh, we, already have, we already know so many good techniques. We know, we know k-means, we know SOM, we know backpropagation, we know reinforcement learning, we know, we know deep learning who is beating everybody. Why should I think about yet another method? Hmm? Why should I do that? I thought we can apply deep learning on everything. No, we can't. So why should we use GAs? Well, evolutionary algorithms are more than genetic algorithms, but I intentionally want to restrict it to genetic algorithms because this is the prototype. It's very simple. Things can get really complicated. I'll give you one example maybe at the end. Things can get really complicated. So I want to I wanna stick with the canonical genetic algorithm, really simple structure. <clears throat> so why should I use that? Well, you know what? I, I love coding, and I'm really big on things that are simple and easy to implement. So this is easy to code. Do you disagree? Can, how long does it take you to code a flexible model for convolutional neural network from scratch. You would need two, three months. Of course, I would need probably four months in my age. So how long do you need for this? Give me a, I don't know, okay, with all debugging, okay, a day. I have it. So this is easy to code. That's a big factor for me as an engineer. But you say, okay, there are libraries. I know, but there is always the possibility that you have to come up with customized solution. And as engineers, when you go out there, you will realize it within the first year. The libraries are great and we have to know them, but they will not solve all problems. In many situations, you have to develop from scratch. So another reason that we should use JA, uh, genetic algorithms, they use many solutions or they provide many solutions so that means they can avoid they can avoid local extrema so if they give me at the end after whatever 10000 what do we say for evolutionary algorithm iterations episodes Generation, I like that, generation. So after 500 generations, then what it remains in the population is only fit parents. That's really good, you give me a lot of alternatives. You get, take this solution or that solution or this solution. That's very flexible. Of course, You can do genetic algorithms in parallel. So I, I, can, I can send it to several cores, several processors to say, you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this. I don't need GPUs, well, unless you are working with images. That's extremely valuable. That you can break it down, that population, send, I don't know, a quarter of it to this core. Well, nowadays you have, 94 cores on, on a single machine. So if you can do multi-threading, fantastic. So life is good. Things are fast. Evolution is not that slow. <clears throat> okay, good. Easy to code. It uses or, I don't know, maybe, maybe I do gives or provides many solutions. And that's good because it avoids, many of them are really high quality solutions. 
And then I can, I can implement it in a parallel fashion so it goes fast. OK. But there is no free lunch. So what is, what is the problem with GAs? Well, they have problems too, like any other technique. So what are the shortcomings? of GAs. You know, toward the end of the, the term, I have grown more suspicious because I was beaten badly by complex techniques. And I didn't ask this at the beginning. What is good about this technique? What is bad about this technique? And I went into it. Oh my god, it takes such a long time to design a deep network and train it. Reinforcement learning even worse. Fuzzy system, yeah, but they, they cannot learn. Every method has a problem. I want to know it now from, at, from the beginning, such that I can plan my design. Well, guess what? They are slow. They are not just slow. They are extremely slow. They drive you to insanity. They are that slow. It, and that's, of course, because of their nature. Evolution cannot happen really fast. You have to give the evolution time to change things in proper way. So they are slow. If you have a real-time application, you, need, you have 200 microseconds time to do something. I would guess from the get-go evolutionary techniques are not the best approach. So because you get to have, I don't know, five, six seconds at least, even if you use multi-core and whatever. So I have to know that. That's, that's very important. Fitness function may not be may not be easily designed. How do I know? Well, we don't know. What is the fitness function? The driving force of evolutionary techniques or fitness function. And there is no classic fitness function. Also, I, I go with RBF. No, there is no RBF. OK, I go with sigmoidal. <laughs> what are you talking about? The fitness function for evolutionary algorithm comes from the nature of the problem. So we have to sit down, understand the problem. Something that sometimes when we are lazy, we don't like to do that. So just give it to me. Well, I don't know what it is. OK. Okay, you are, you are slowly but surely convincing me. Okay, okay, good, okay. I can, I can get engaged with this idea. But if I want to start this, and you're talking about the initialization of population, how many? So what is the population size? Or basically, you are asking how many, how many chromosomes in one generation. And we said that that word generation is our replacement for iteration, episodes, and so on. So now we talk about evolutionary algorithm. If you go to an evolutionary conference, and between the break between two sessions, talks to, I don't know, postdocs, and it's like, yeah, my evolutionary algorithm had some iterations. I said, what? what, what? Your algorithm did what? They don't get it, because they talk all about generation. <clears throat> Sometimes, of course, they do it intentionally, so just to be annoying. So, OK. So one is you may choose too many. So I have a problem. I don't know. You have to see what the problem is. OK. You know what? Computers are good. I have a lot of memory. Uh, I go with one million chromosomes. OK. So then your genetic algorithm will be extremely, extremely sluggish it will be it will be just go forever 
you're back in 1995 and you have a multi-layer perceptron with eight layers and it runs and runs and runs and doesn't come back. So it's not a solution to just, okay, I have memory, just go with as many as you want. You cannot do that. Okay, okay, so I go other way around. I, I will grab just too few. No, I go with 10, 10 chromosomes. So there, there, if you do that, there are not many possibilities for mating, which is crossover. What type of society would that be? There is there's not much choice. Nobody likes that. which makes the algorithm behave in a way that only a part of the search space will be sampled. Did we talk last time about 400 and chess and 2 to the power 400 and how big that number is? That if you even start counting from the Big Bang to today, you have not even started to count how much, how big 2 to 400 is. 400 bits, if you go with 10 bits, how much is the search space that you can search? It's not big. So you will be very limited. Yes? Absolutely not. We don't care about derivatives. This is mother nature, so it just has its own forces. It doesn't need to be differentiable at all. It has to be connected to the application, but not differentiable. So maybe we get there and we have some, some, uh, some better idea what that means. OK. Differentiable is all for gradient descent. That's the engineering world, but not, not the natural world. OK. Yes? I have a question. So in the formulation of G, it seems like we can, any, like any one of the chromosomes can have crossover with any other chromosome. Yes. But in nature, we have like a group of males and females and only males with each other. Yes. Uh, I'm sure there are, but we don't model that. Uh, at least I'm not aware of any GA evolutionary model who has made that specification among the chromosomes because then you have to really model what is, what is female, what is male. So is it, let's say it's an extremely tolerant society. <laughs> so what about the crossover frequency? There may be some versions out there. I don't, I'm not aware of any. <clears throat> so how, how often do we let fit parents mate? Well, you can say, OK, you know what, all the time. So 100%. If you do that, that means all offsprings all offsprings are made by a crossover, right? How else? If you do never, so 0%, then that means you're just copying the parents. Can you do that? Can I just copy? Uh, if I see a couple or a parent who is extremely fit, maybe I give that parent a bonus and say, you can copy paste yourself. You're such a good parent. I, we need more like you. So we can, we can, we can reproduce, we can, select to rep we can select to cross over, we can let them reproduce just by itself, something that 
There is also no, well, not under normal circumstances, unless it's a Hollywood movie, no individual in a species can do. You need always the pair. So perhaps it's reasonable to copy some chromosomes, which is, what does it mean, how many? Some chromosomes into next generation. Into next, into into the next generation. It, the, perhaps it makes sense. We don't need to mate and pair them all the time. If you see that there are good parents, and say, yeah, okay, I copy paste you. Yeah, two more like you. Come on. Okay. Probably I don't know. 80% to 95%, something like that. We have to play with this. For some cases, for some cases maybe, I don't know, 60%. I'm just throwing empirical numbers at you. One of the things that you have to learn in AI is don't freak out when you hear the number. Who said that? What is the formula for that 60%? No, people made some experiment and it seems that number makes sense for some application. That's what, all, what it all means. You may work out and say, no, not 60%, 52%. OK. <clears throat> Good. OK, so sometimes we should just copy-paste parents. And it's also cheaper. Copy-pasting, reproducing just by, by itself, is much cheaper than crossover. Right? I have to find the crossover point. I have to f just swap them. It's a lot of computational. If I have one million chromosomes, it's a lot of work. OK, OK. What about mutation frequency? So how often should I apply mutation? Again, you can go. You know what? Never. So 0% of the time. So what happens if I never apply mutation? Then there is no additional from sporadic, from time to time appearing diversity in the offspring. So no change in copies, if you copy, or in offsprings. No additional change, right? So if you never apply mutation. And you will make the painful experience that it does take longer when there is no mutation. Interestingly. You have no idea where to apply mutation. You randomly select it. I mean, a certain probability. So here you are saying never. So with zero probability. So let's say we said that second option is too often. What is too often? I don't know. Whatever. So let's say half of the time. So 50%. Is 50% too much for mutation? What? If the danger is to get adult filter, yes. But maybe we are lucky when we get a lot of Albert Einstein. Well, wishful thinking. Those comes just maybe one or two per century. <laughs> so what happens? What happens? What, what's bad about that? Think about it. If I apply mutation too often, 50% of the time, I grab a random digit, let's say this guy, this position, flip it from 0 to 1 or from 1 to 0. That's the mutation if I go with binary encoding. Just flip it. You mutate it to a new state. But then the position, whether it's low significant bit or high significant bit, it makes a small impact or a big impact. So what can go wrong if I do this too often? What can go wrong? It's not bad. I'm just applying mutation. 
No, you may get 50 Hitlers, and they are fighting. There is no peace. What is peace? Convergence. So, huge variability. Preventing convergence. So if you if you just do that, you don't you don't let the nature take its course and get somewhere. I want to get somewhere, you create another guy, another guy, another guy, this person, that person. So let me work with what I have. I want to figure out where to go, and then you suddenly change it again. So diversity is good, but too much diversity is problematic. Again, don't bring this in social Darwinism. <laughs> I'm talking algorithms. <clears throat> so, and then third time, third possibility is rarely. I don't know what, what is rarely. Let's say 1% of the time. OK, what is the difference between 0% of the time and 1% of the time? A lot. A lot. So this is one of those things. You see you see, piece of work of a genius artist, and it's just blue, and then there is a yellow dot. And that's in a museum, and people are willing to pay $450 million to buy it. So this is additional diversity contributing to good solutions. Why is that? Well, don't forget, we do crossover. We do reproduction, copy pasting. That already brings, the crossover part brings a lot of diversity. So you don't need to exaggerate it here. Just be modest. Be modest with mutation. Uh, for instance, the probability of mutation is 1 over 1,000. So 1 out of 1,000 chromosomes we apply mutation. Every, every 999 go, the thousands one, apply. So typically, typically we are between 0.5% to 1%. Typically, this is, this is the range of mutation for most problems. OK, good, good. I'm, I'm getting a good picture how to implement this stuff. Because this is clear guidance for implementation. How, how do I do that? Because every algorithm needs a setting, needs to be configured, then I can apply to get something meaningful. OK, OK. One more question, one more question. How do I select parents? How to select? Parents. Well, this is the actual thing. Because the population is the first step of any generation is select parents. And then either copy paste them because they are good parents, or apply crossover, and in some cases mutation, and then put them back in the population, the offsprings, if they are good kids. OK, there are, there are some ways of doing it. First, how do I select parents? When fitness values are very different, So what does that mean? So I have some fitnesses, and the fitness values are all over the place. I have low, I have medium, I have high, I have very high, I have extremely low. 
So if that happens, I can rank my chromosomes based on their fitness, and then I can select the ones maybe at the top because they are very fit. So we do parent selection if there is a gigantic amount of diversity in the fitness values. So, so we call this rank selection, which means we rank, we rank all chromosomes we rank all chromosomes based on, based on their fitness values. Their fitness values, and then you select the top ones. Can it be that I, in some generation I grab again and again the same two panels because they are fit, they are at the top? That can happen, yes. But don't forget the crossover, because crossover happens at a random, random bit, random position. But you have to keep, you need to do some bookkeeping. If that happens, maybe I come down and grab another one. It's always good to bring in a little bit of randomness in the selection. Second, <clears throat> what happens when, when fitness values are not very different? When fitness values are not very different, it doesn't mean they are good or bad. They are just not different. So it could be all of them are have low fitness values, or all of them have medium fitness values, or all of them have high fitness values. So they are not very different. So I cannot say who is good, who is bad. All of them are bad at the same level. So which one should I take? So if, the, if values are very different, I know who is on the top, who is at the bottom. Well, in these cases, we can do um, roulette wheel. Selection. Just rotate the wheel and select one of them. So, which means you have, if I can draw that circle, so you, assume, you assign segments or fragments of that wheel that you are rotating according to the fitness value of people. Uh, sorry, according to the probability of occurrence of those uh, fitness values. How many times do I have that fitness value? You may need to discretize to count them together. So that means, for example, so if, I, if, if this is the point, and then you rotate it, and it stops at one of them, it's OK, I go with this one. So if it is very frequent, there's a higher chance that you grab it. If it is not very frequent, like this one, so I will not grab it very often. So if the fitness values are not very different, I have to go with the probability. Frequency, how many times I see things like this. And I have to put them together because you may not get exactly uh, to, to group them. You have to put things, you see, this is a, there will be a lot of details in the implementation. How, how do I do this? This would be one of the sticky points for me. Ah, oh, okay, I, this is one of the points that I come down and go drink a coffee, come back. Grab the paper, not this. Okay, let me look it up on the web. How have other people done it? You have to think about it. But it's clear. If fitness variables are very different, I rank them themselves. Grab the best ones. Simple. If they are not very different, then I have to work with some sort of frequency and probability for which I may be forced to quantize stuff. Okay, okay. So, what are other models? Well, there are many models. Other GA models. Maybe I'm just so excited. I just want to know ahead of time. 
island models were quite interesting. And uh, so we said you, you have a population, and inside that population you have a lot of chromosomes. And then you apply whatever I talked about. You apply selection, crossover, mutation, added to the population if, if, if good enough. Now what happens if I have another population? What happens if I have another population? Well, this is what happens in the nature. What happens if I have another population? So, and they are migrating among each other. Well, I would not implement this first because definitely this would be much more difficult to implement. So I would implement just one circle and assume that this species has nothing to do with other species. So, but each, if you have four, five, ten, n populations with distinct genetic material and there is possibility to migrate. So they have, I don't know, either, either they come illegally and you cannot build a wall to not let them go, they come. Or you are nice and you have an immigration policy. You say, come on, guys, you want to live here, come. Just behave. Just go. come here. So we can do that. But clearly, the implementation of this is much more complicated than, than individual model. So these are, these are basically subpopulation. And these arrows indicate migration, which has been a powerful, powerful way in the nature to things. So Homo sapiens came out, went to, to Europe, went to uh, through South Asia, went to Far East Asia. So, and there was, there was a time that, this is just interesting to know, so there was a time that for political reason, the government in China tried to prove that the Chinese are from, descendant from Homo erectus, not from Homo sapiens. Very interesting story when politics come into the play and want to change science. And they, they did, so they said, no, we are, we, are, we are Chinese, we are different. Nobody wants to be the same. Everybody wants to be different. I don't, I have not still, understood that why we want to be different. Whereas we exactly know we are the same. No, no, I'm different. So the government wanted to prove that the Chinese are from descendants from Homo erectus. For political reason, clearly. So they run the largest genetic experiment ever conducted with, if I'm not mistaken, more than 70,000 samples taken across China. China is not a small country. And many, many years of changing and matching and so on. Surprise, surprise. Chinese are also homo sapiens. <laughs> uh, you, you could have asked me, I would have told you. You could <laughs> give that money to me and support my research. Yeah, OK. So migration is good. And of course, that the reason that they thought that, they had, they had a little bit of base, because there was a lot more fossils of homo erectus in Far East Asia than, let's say, in Europe, in a specific part of Europe. And that was a good pretext. I said, oh, look, look, we are, we are this. We are not that. Well, we migrated a lot. So if, if for, just for fun, if you have that $120, do that DNA test for fun. Don't take it seriously. And you will see you are mixed in a tiny, 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 tiny fragment of the genome. So, okay, interesting. Okay, I'm getting close. How should I initialize? How to initialize GAs? How to initialize the population? How do I do that? Well, generally random. I'm pretty sure randomness has played a role when we left today's Ethiopia, the beautiful Africa, and we went so some of us say, okay, I go left, and some of us say, oh, I go right. I'm pretty sure 
most of those decisions have been random. <clears throat> and second, we could embed domain knowledge. We could embed domain knowledge to seed the population. So if you know something about the problem, there is no reason to torture the algorithm. If you have something, if you know something, give it to the algorithm and say, there could be good solutions here. Spend more time here. Why not? You are biasing it, of course. But is it really based on knowledge? OK, then bias it. Then bias is a good thing. Bias it. And third, it has to be a uniform, uniform mixture. It has to be a uniform mixture of possible values. We talked about that neural network. You cannot initialize the weights of a neural network just with zeros. You don't go anywhere. You have to break the symmetry. Same applies here. Everybody cooks with water. So diversity is good. Having a really diverse population to start with is always good. Neural network, reinforcement learning, genetic algorithm, it doesn't matter. It's a good starting point to start from a diverse population. <clears throat> OK. I'm getting really close, really close. I want to have a break, but I have maybe one more question before I have a more realistic idea about this. OK, OK, OK. So let's say I do this. I, I, I go through the, all the torture and implement this. OK, when to stop? When to stop the evolution? Well, there are many options. We can go with maximum number of generations, which you will do some painful experiments until you find, OK, 100 generation is super fast. 500 generation is very small, very slow. I don't know, I go with 200 or 5,000 gener generations, or 10,000 generations. So you have to find out. But then I said it and say, go 5,000 generations and then stop. Then give me the population, whatever you get. Second, <clears throat> you can look for a minimum level of diversity. You don't want maximum diversity, right? If if the evolution has done its job, then everybody inside the population is fit. Everybody is fit. So you don't want much diversity at the end. At the beginning, you like diversity. Toward the end, you don't like diversity. So minimum level of diversity to stop. Third, well, some level of fitness. Some level of fitness. If you have an idea, what is the maximum fitness for a chromosome is two. And you have 500 chromosomes. OK, 500 times two is 1,000. OK, go until maximum fitness is 700 at least. So target a, uh, some, level of, some level of fitness. Four. So we have many ways to stop, apparently. Certain number of certain number of generations <clears throat> when no significance, no significant, no significant fitness change 
occurs. So not just a certain number of maximum number of generation, what you say, you know what? Why do we say that? Because if I have number of generations, and I have the fitness total, the total fitness, then what happens is this, something like this. So the last one is saying, look, what is a certain number of generations that no big change happened? No big change. So down here you stop. You realize it's, it's 150 generations. There is no big change in fitness anymore. I, I pushed it at the beginning. I gained a lot after fluctuations. But now it's going 222, 221, 222, 221, 200. So it's not going anywhere anymore. So stop it. Don't waste the computational time. So a certain number of generations, which could be whatever, 10, 20, 50, 100, depending on what is the max number of generation, if no significant change, what is significant? Well, have you taken the statistics? Significant. No significant change is happening. Standard deviation is really low. <clears throat> OK. So we want to take eight minutes break, and then we start at 6.50. Is that good?